online service. We're so glad you've joined us. Please feel free to leave a comment below. Let us know that you're here. And if you need prayer for anything, please let us know that too. Now let's jump into some worship.
this is what heaven sounds like. We praise we lift our you, we praise you. This, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. You cannot survive when we praise you. The God of Thank you that we can praise you in the middle of all of it. That we can praise you before the breakthrough comes, God. Thank you that we're fighting from victory, not for victory, God. That you've already conquered it all, God. That your love has already won it all, God. That we can celebrate that you came as a baby in the middle of it all, in the middle of the chaos, in the middle of the trial, in the middle of the storm, God, you come in the middle of it, and we thank you that you meet us where we are, God. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in this place, God. In the name of Jesus, amen.
come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels see. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. you today. Be with us here. And we worship you. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, we're so glad you guys are with us tonight. Go ahead and air five somebody next to you. Six feet apart. Say, hey, how's it going? See somebody you haven't seen in a while. Welcome them. Hi, I'm Candice. I'm Josiah. And we are from the middle school youth group here. If today is your first time, it's your first Sunday, we invite you to text NEW to 970-432-7992. We would love to get you connected to one of our pastors here, and we believe that you're here for such a time as this. And we welcome you, and we're so glad that you're joining us today. Speaking of this time, I don't know if you notice, but Christmas is rolling around. Guys, we have five services that we're offering to you. One on Wednesday at 7, as well as Thursday at 1, and then 3 o'clock, both in the main auditorium and in the chapel, and at 5 o'clock as well. If you can do us a favor and just go to canyonview.com and register for one of those services, we'd really appreciate it. Now we'd like to pray over the tithe and offering. And if you look at the comments below, there will be a link for giving. So Father, I just thank you so much for everyone who is watching with us today. God, I just um, pray blessings over them and their families and keep them safe. Father, I just uh, thank you for your words and thank you for how you're going to speak through Pastor Corey today. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Last week, we started our Advent series. Uh, how many of you were able to either be here or watch it online? If you didn't, don't worry. You're not you know, going to hell because you missed it. Don't worry. Uh, but it's really important that as a church family, we understand we're in this season of expectancy. And why we say expectancy is because we have this incredible Advent. Advent means the coming. It means the, the arrival. And we have the arrival of Christ 2,000 years ago. So we have that victory which when you were singing and you had a word while you were singing, you said we, I love how you said that. You said we, um, we uh, are celebrating the victory, not what's coming. Or how did you say it? Do you remember? Uh, it's like from, victory. from victory, not for victory. Wasn't that awesome? And so we, that's Advent. We have that at the coming of Christ. But we also have the coming of Jesus the second time. He will return and he'll put all things new. So last week we had the candle of hope. Everybody shout out hope. And then this week, I don't know if others have done Advent in your past or anything, this next week is what we're going to teach on, and anybody on the count of three yell out the word you think it is. If you get it wrong, no worries, you still get points. One, two, three. What'd you say? Priest? We're celebrating priests. No. 
<laughs> peace. Yeah. So the second candle of Advent is peace, and we're going to talk about that. And you've, you've probably thought before, well, yeah, peace, I've heard all about that. But the question that we have to ask ourselves tonight is really simple on a scale of one to ten. One being you are really jacked up, stressed out, full of anxiety. That's one. Ten, I'm just like so at peace. My, my finances are at peace. My family's at peace. My football team's at peace. Like this would be 10, right? So one to 10, you're just kind of level of peace and be really honest and really authentic right now with yourself. And what number would you give? And on the count of three, I want you to yell it out. I know it's very vulnerable. If the person next to you hears you say a two, you're gonna be like, what? But I want you to yell it out because I have this incredible gift that I can hear all the numbers and I'll give you the average. So one, two, three, what's your number? All right, so this particular group is at 6.73. Very good, very good. So here's the bad news. About three-fourths into way into my talk, your number's gonna go down. You're gonna say, I'm actually less than I thought it was. But then by the end, you're gonna come back up. So get ready for an emotional roller coaster, okay? And uh, we're going to be using this new teaching TV. We used it in Chicago. It helps. We really do everything on purpose with intentionality. And we want scripture to come out loud and clear. We also have to be better at what we do online with all the online activity. So this is a tool that we're trying to steward well. People have asked me, typically guys, man, what's... What size is that TV? Is that like a 55 inch? You know, it's like, and they sound like that. And so, you know, you measure things in either cubits in the Old Testament or yards. We have a different way of measuring here. And so this TV is, is this is the size it is. <laughs> this TV is a full size Yamaguchi. So from right here to up here is, ex this is exactly the size of Kirk. He's 5'2". And so anything roughly five feet is called a Yamaguchi. This is one Yamaguchi. When you go, when you go to Best Buy and you're going to get a TV or something for Christmas, just say, you got, you got that Yamaguchi size? And uh, we'll see if they get it for you. <laughs> anyway, let's pray real quick. Because I do believe that the Lord wants us to have more peace internally and in our life right now. And there's some really nuggets in Scripture to help do that. So Holy Spirit, come. Prepare our hearts. Help us to understand. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. So what we're going to start with is a story in the Bible, but I want you to see this picture of it. So there's this guy named Rembrandt. 400 years ago, he painted this incredible painting. So you've seen it before. I can't remember if I showed it here before or not, but maybe. And uh, this is called The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. It's 400 years old. You can see it here next to me, or you can see it up on the screen. You have 13 men in here, and you have Jesus down here just getting woken up, and different people doing different things. Later, I'm going to ask you, are you like this guy or that guy? So kind of watch this as I read the story. Interestingly, this painting was stolen. It was in a museum in Boston, and in 1990, it was stolen with 13 other pieces of art, and it's one of the great mysteries of art thefts. It's still, no one knows where it is. So I'm just going to take a moment. If you're watching this online, and you, I'm not even kidding, and you have stolen this piece of art, I believe it's beautiful, and that it is something that humanity should see. So part of you going closer to Jesus, I would ask that you would repent. Repent for stealing it. I would ask that you'd return it to Canyon View Vineyard Church in care of Pastor Corey Sondral. And we will see that the, we will make sure that the world gets to appreciate this piece of art. Okay? So you never know. What if it happened? So let me read the story. It's in the book of Mark. And it has everything to do with peace, guys. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let's go to the other side. So it's Jesus talking, and he says, let's go to the other side. So what does Jesus say is going to happen? We're going to go to the other side, right? So this is God saying something's going to happen. We're going to the other side. Where are they going? They're going to the other side, right? So he tells these guys this, that have been seeing him doing all sorts of things. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and the other bo uh, uh, boats were with him too. 
And a great windstorm arose. How many people have been on the Sea of Galilee? Some people travel over there. I've been there. The way the cliffs are, I've been there a couple times. It comes off the cliffs, down, hits the water, creates these big storms. It still happens today. And the great windstorm arose, and the waves are breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling up with water. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And so this is like major anxiety time, chaos, potential death, and Jesus is sleeping on the job, right? I mean, this is how it appears to them. Crazy chaos, lots of anxiety, and Jesus is resting. They said to him, teacher, it's probably this guy in the painting. He's like grabbing Jesus very aggressively, I might add, in that painting. He says, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? It's like if we don't see God doing something, then he must not care. So humanity will quickly slip into, if I don't see something happen, if I don't see God doing something, then he must not care about me. And Jesus awoke, and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Now, this particular peace in Greek is more like, shh, stop it, silent. In sign language, it's stop now. So this is a peace with authority that just says, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said to them, dudes, that's in my version, Bros, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is this guy that even the wind and the sea obey him? Why I wanted to start with this is because, one, I love this piece of art. But I also see that this great storm that's occurring is a great metaphor for so many of us right now. Like, what's your crashing wave right now? What's your curiosity and fear? Are you wondering, you're not seeing Jesus move at all and whatever it might be, your finances or something? Let's go a little closer on that painting because I love how Rembrandt painted the guys around Jesus. So here's Jesus right here. Here's Mr. Aggressive. Do something! He's going to make it happen. Now, as I say these things, I want you to say, oh yeah, that's like me. Or no, 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 that's like my husband. Or whatever. This guy's trying to make it happen. I don't know what this guy's doing. I think, he, I, I think he's looking at Jesus and he's just not sure what to do. We got this guy down here who's at the feet of Jesus praying. We got this guy over here who's breaking the fourth wall, looking at all of us saying, what are you doing looking at this painting? I like that. This guy's back to him. This guy's my favorite. He's vomiting. He's throwing up over like, I can't take this anymore. I am literally sick, and this has got to stop. I don't know, maybe you feel like that. Uh, This guy over here, he just seems like he's stealing something. I don't know what he's doing. Uh, And over here, this is the guy that I kind of want to be. This guy is responsible for the boat. He's responsible for the people in it. He's kind of leading in that moment. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing, but his eyes are fixed on Jesus. I don't know where you're at these days, but I find myself oftentimes like a variety of these men here, and I know that I need peace, but I don't need peace like the world talks about peace. I need peace like the Bible talks about peace. And so let's look at that because what we have here was Jesus being a non-anxious presence in a very anxious situation. And what we've been invited into as followers of Jesus is to be a non-anxious presence in a very anxious world right now, right? And so we're all on this journey together. What does it look like to navigate an anxious world right now when... Anxiety is more contagious than COVID, without question. If you have an anxious person in your family, when they come into the room, the room changes. 
When you have an anxious person at the workplace, or you have an anxious person uh, in your uh, club or something, and that person walks in freaking out, what happens to the room? Typically, the room goes towards anxiety, but here's what's really cool, and science has proved this, and the Bible shows this, that when a person who is non-anxious enters a room and has the peace of God, which we'll talk about in a little moment how to get there, that actually that also changes the room. Both are contagious. But right now, there's a lot more crazy anxiety people than there are calm, confident, trusting in the Lord people on the planet, right? So let's look at this. The first thing I want to see is this word peace. We see this word peace and we think world peace. We think, uh, uh, I don't know what you think, but a lot of people think about peace is the absence of conflict. We'll talk about how that's not actually true. This idea of peace continues throughout the world. Did you know that there's the number one hand gesture in the world right now? <laughs> I know it's dangerous what you might be thinking. Uh, the number one hand gesture, here's Naruto right here, if you don't know anime, and just whether it's anime, whether it's K-pop, if you're a BTS fan, the army, the most, without question, the most common hand signal on the planet right now is this, peace especially in, in Generation Z. You look at any pictures around the world, mostly even to the east on our planet, and you'll see young people, and they're all doing this. See, there's something in us, it seems silly, that I think is longing for peace. We're longing for it deeply, but not like this trivial peace, like, like peace that is not conflict. That's not peace. I mean, if the lack of conflict was peace, that just sounds fairly boring to me. I mean, we want lack of conflict. You want less conflict in your family. But you see, the Bible has something very different than the absence of conflict. Peace in the Bible goes back to this word, shalom, which many of you know. It starts in Genesis when God says to Abraham, and I will give you shalom. Gideon creates an altar saying, God is shalom. It, the, the altar is called Jehovah Shalom. In Proverbs, it talks about shalom. Shalom is not the absence of peace. Many of you have known this, but we're going to do a deep dive tonight. So even if you've heard a talk about shalom a lot, let the Holy Spirit give you something new right now. Shalom, literally in the Bible, means completeness. Shalom means in the Bible wholeness or where peace is not the absence of conflict, peace is the presence of wholeness. Uh, in the Bible, it actually starts with this idea of putting a brick wall or brick house together and you put all the bricks, if you can imagine bricks really well done, put together. And if all of the bricks are there, if all of the bricks are solid, if everything's as it should be, you have just shalomed that wall. That wall, that wall is shalomed. That, that's how the word can be used. If a piece is missing here and there and here and here and here and here and here, and it's not complete, it's not integrated, it's, it's not in shalom. So disconnected means not in shalom or not in peace. Shalom is referring to all things getting put together. A greeting currently for Jewish people in the past and today is a cool greeting. It's not just shalom, but there's one greeting that is, forgive it, I'm going to say it wrong probably, I'll do my best. But the greeting is mashlamech. So I'd go to Amber and I'd say mashlamech, and you'd say mashlamech back, right? Go ahead, try. No, great, okay. For safety, for COVID reasons, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so mashlamech. The question that they're asking is, how's your shalom? Isn't that a great spiritual formation question? Like that's a great discipleship question if you're like working with people or your spouse. How's, how's your shalom today? How are you feeling? Are you whole? Are you complete? Are you integrated? Are you authentic? Is everything in your life well-being? How's your shalom? Everything, not just your inner feeling. That's when I'm thinking, okay, you're realizing now that your, sh your, your peace level is going lower because <laughs> it's connected to so many things. 
So the opposite of shalom then is an interesting word. Dr. Carissa Quinn really uses this word. This is interesting. So think about what's the what's the opposite of shalom? Opposite of whole, opposite of connected. Well, the word that is I think really good is fragmented. A fragmented life, right? Fragmented would mean that those bricks all aren't there. There are things disconnected. There are uh, how do you say that thing? Um you're a, a, a square block trying to go in a round hole. You know, all of these ideas are fragmented. And now we start thinking what could be fragmented or disconnected in our life. And here's a list. It's, you're not going to be able to read all these. I just put them up for effect. We start in the big, our countries being at war and terrorism, that's fragmented. Racism and ethnic cleansing and politics, that includes hate, blame, and division. Church theology and practices, so many churches are against each other, that's fragmented. Creation, our land and our resources, medicine, pandemic response, people have all these different ideas and fragmentation. Our attention is fragmented. The biggest currency on the planet right now, we talked about it a few weeks ago, is your attention. Everybody wants it, and it's coming right through your phone, so the people that are marketing through all the different social medias are trying to get you. They want your attention. Your attention is completely fragmented. I know this because I teach to large groups, and I can see when people are on their phones. They're fragmented, right? Trent, put your phone away. So, no, I'm just kidding. He's always in in focus. Uh, Attention, relationships, friends and workmates. Do you have any friends, workmates, family that is now fragmented in your life right now? Are you getting along with your brothers and your sisters and your moms and your grandkids? And do you have any fragmented life situations there? Most people do. Our personal identity is fragmented. I worked with a lot of people in Chicago who were transgender, who were going through the process of trying to figure out how to follow Jesus and yet struggling with their sexual and gender identity. Incredibly complicated, and every situation was very unique. And they were fragmented people trying to figure out how to be whole. Bodies are fragmented through nutrition and lack of exercise. Oh my gosh. Our minds, mental health, conflicting thoughts, of course, and our soul is fragmented. And so all of these are 13 things. Only four of them can we actually do anything about. So nine of them, we have no control. And they're around us in our life and they're fragmented. This is a bad deal. This is like a really tough situation. What would we do then to have a life of not being anxious when we only can control four of these things. Well, we're going to get to it here in a moment. But one more thing to make it worse. <laughs> so glad you came to church today. All this great news. So as, as you think of this as a funnel for anxiety that can come into a person, getting under the last four that are our personal issues, then very much within each one of us is this very, very, very specific thing that happens that impacts shalom and anxiety. And that's real simple. When a stimulus of some sort occurs, like somebody cuts me off in my car, then my response is something. And so we all have a stimulus. Something will happen. Somebody will say something to you that's the total opposite political opinion. Something happens in you in this process, and you respond in a certain way. Somebody, uh, uh, maybe you find out you lost your job. Something happens in you and you respond a certain way. Maybe uh, somebody uh, 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 says something that's completely offensive and racist to you. And you respond in a certain way. So what can happen for, a not, or for an anxious person that isn't in shalom? Okay, I'm not going to get too psychological here. It's meant to be quick. Is this moment in here becomes an auto-response because of things in the past, the way you see life, all of these things, and it's oftentimes very negative. So if Julia says to me something like, hey, uh, the garbage isn't out yet, and my response is, I'm going to get to it. Jeez. Now, I don't do that. I used to do that. Well, that's because maybe... When I took out the garbage as a young kid, I kept getting in trouble all the time, and I don't need another mom, right, or whatever. And so you can apply whatever stimulus happens, and you have a response. Now, here's why I bring this up. We're going to get to that right in this moment, 
that what happens to most of us is it's automated. And what we need to do is not have that automated and say, how do we hold every thought captive in Christ and bring the peace of God into this moment? Something happens. Okay, God, come into my life. Give me shalom. So I respond in a certain way. Typically, the first step is to make this longer is to have a longer response time, to think about it, to process it. So that's all I'm going to say. This is, we're going to look at this more in January and February as we get into soul care and emotional health. But why I wanted to bring this up, at the very, very, very origin of our problems on this planet is this moment in every single one of us. And it's time to say, you know what? I'm no longer going to let different stimuli affect how I respond but God is going to affect how I respond because I'm a person of shalom and my response is going to be something that advances the kingdom of God versus break it down. It's that stinking moment, guys. So what do we do? Does that make sense? Just say, just say yes so I can keep going. If you said no, I'd talk another five hours. So fragmented, what do we do? So I'm going to back the truck up now and understand shalom in that moment. And it comes through Isaiah 9, 6 of who is the shalom bringer, the shalom maker, the shalom as a verb bringer. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This word right here, guys. Prince of Peace, that word is in the Isaiah. So this is our English, but in Hebrew, what's that word? Shalom. So Jesus comes as the Prince of wholeness, completeness, bringing everything back together. Ha, ah, now it gets super interesting. Because the word shalom also means restoration. In the Old Testament, say you had a cow. Anybody here have a cow? A donkey? If anybody has the donkey that's about two blocks away from my house, it makes a lot of noise at five in the morning. If you could process it for glue, that would be great. So there's this, there's this, uh, oh yeah, the ox. If you have a cow and it goes to your neighbor, breaks your neighbor's fence, this is literally, literally Old Testament stuff, then what you would do, you're responsible, so you would go to your neighbor, you would pay for or build the fence, and you would, quote, make shalom with them. You would restore what was there, and that is shaloming them. So Jesus comes to shalom everything. Creation, us, animals, land. He's going to bring it all back together. Now, how this happens, the verb is shalom, I just explained it. When you restore something, a restore a relationship, you just shalom somebody. People of God are people that we just shalom all over the place. So when, when I first got here, I t- taught you a silly little greeting. I'd say, here's a way to say hi to each other. Shalom me, homie. It means something. Not only are you, may you be blessed, But I want to be someone in your life that helps the process of everything coming back together and not fragmented. So peace I leave with you, Jesus says. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is the peace of God. So real quick, peace of God is what everybody wants. (laughs) I want it. Do you guys want it? The peace of God. Yes, peace of God. Of course we do. We want to be more peaceful. We want to be less stressed. We want to have less anxiety. Uh, We don't want to flip out when we hear something. We want our responses to be healthy. You know, all of these, the peace of God, you know, like Kirk Yamaguchi, that dude, man, not hardly anything gets under his, his feathers or whatever that term would be, really. I mean, I've seen him hit the worst golf shots in the world and, and he doesn't throw his club or anything. But he's just got this kind of, he's got this peace of God thing going. And this is what we want, but we can't just make this happen. To have the peace of God, there's something that has to be a foundation to that. We see it in Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is really important. The only way to have the peace of God is to realize that you have peace with God. Now, you've probably heard that before. You cannot have the peace of God unless you have peace with God through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. But let's take that lower, because there's one more thing here to be able to have peace with God, and that's to realize something about God. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Everybody say, blood of Christ. For he himself is our... Oh, this is fascinating. So he himself is our peace or is the shalom that brings us back together with God. He has made us both one with God and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, in this case between Jewish and non-Jewish people in that writing, but it also means between Republicans and Democrats, between the poor and the rich, between the black and the white between those that are oppressed and those that oppress. You see, Jesus is going for full out, (laughs) full out unity and shalom on this planet. And there will be one day, there will be complete shalom. But at this point, if you didn't know it, we are the ambassadors of shalom on this planet. Now, there's a great painting. This one, do you guys know the Ninja Turtles? So Ninja Turtles are are, are who? Who are the four? Michelangelo, Leonardo, Leonardo, Donatello, and Raphael. Raphael painted this one. Now, not the turtle, but 500 years ago, this is one of the most old, and some people think one of maybe the oldest crucifixion art pieces that's still left in good shape. And it was by Raphael. Uh, and I just want you to look at this. It's priceless. For in him all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things. Whether on earth or in heaven. Making peace. By the blood of his cross. I'm going to read that again. Just keep this up. Let this sink in. For in him was the fullness of God, was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace, making shalom by the blood of his cross. This is really important, and you may know this, but this is real simple language for you to tell others three things on this. You can't have the peace of God until you have peace with God. And the only way to have peace with God is to realize that this God is a God of peace. You see, it's not because of what we did to make peace with God Like, I accepted Christ, so God is now, we're good now. For he first loved us before we chose him. For he first was the person and God of shalom before we realized we need to accept that. This is real important. When Gideon puts up the altar to say that Jehovah Shalom, God is peace, he gets it. And then amazing things happen. God of peace. We repent and believe through Jesus Christ and his blood and we have peace with God. And through him now this journey begins with the Holy Spirit that then we have the peace of God. No matter what comes, hell or high water, we are secure in his presence. We are secure in his peace. So where do you need shalom? You know? Like, do you need it in your family? And it's just people are crazy right now. I was walking down the street the other day, visited my son in Coeur d'Alene, had, a, had our masks on because it was honestly, I had it on because I was really cold, and it kind of was like a little mini scarf going on. 
And uh, we are also trying to really be good citizens and we care about others. I don't like wearing a mask, but I wear it because I do want to care for others. I'm, I'm all about community. And some of you may feel very different, and that's okay. We can feel different. That's okay. But I'm walking down the street, and we walk by a bar, that's kind of an outdoor bar, and this one um, lady, we're just minding our own business, we're just happy people walking down the street, and this lady yells, why do you got your mask on outside? You think a tree is going to give you COVID? And I just had to stop and be like, in my head I'm thinking, one, that's really dumb, two... I don't think I can get COVID from a tree. Three, I'm pretty sure you're drunk. Four, you're a woman, but I still want to punch you. Like, this is all going through my head in one second, right? And I did stop. Like, I wanted to turn around because I was just kind of had it with the whole topic, honestly. And I just said, remember that stimulus and response thing? I did. I kind of turned around and like, ah. You know, I didn't have it in me to go say, God bless you or something. And she, I just didn't have it in me in that moment. And she was really drunk, I think. So, but my, what was my point? Why did I bring that up? Oh, because people are crazy. And we're in a situation right now where the people of Shalom stand out. It's really beautiful. I know a lot of you. You guys are beautiful. What I hear happening in this county is just wonderful. Trent is a person of shalom at the place he works over at, over at Humphrey. You know, Eric's a person of shalom and what he's doing and blessing people like crazy, leading worship all over the place. You know, Scott's a person of shalom. He put all the lights up on the building so that you guys would, it'd feel festive when you walked in. Jackie's a person of shalom. She just had a baby and she's blessing the church with social media. I just go, I just go, 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 go. You guys are people of shalom. But I think there's more room. And if you're struggling with this idea of peace and shalom, it is a gift from God. There's one more painting I want to show you to end. Uh, There's a Korean artist. His name is Young Sung Kim. And uh, he's not professionally trained. And he just felt one day that the Lord would have him start painting. And one of his many paintings is this one. And I don't know if you can tell from, from where you're sitting. And The idea is that you're under the water. And you're drowning. And you're looking for oxygen. And you just want to breathe. And Jesus himself, the shalom bringer, reaches under the water to where you are. And his hand is right there. It just really touched me. And I just want to be a guy that's like, yeah, I'm taking your hand. Let the one who is shalom into your life to start restoring and putting back together in completeness and wholeness the different attributes of your life because he wants to do that and so the question is always how we're going to do later julie and i are going to do a uh, my wife and i are going to do a facebook live event coming up next week in which we'll be going through these five ways that you practically can lean into shalom in your life like What do you actually do, you know? So that'll be coming. You'll get more information on that. But really quickly, shalom incubators, or what I call mental health hygiene even, is is a broken record if you've been to church. Now, the reason it's a broken record, and you hear it over and over and over again, is because it's biblical and it works. Shalom incubators, more shalom in your life. 
Here's what happens as a pastor. Someone comes in, freaks out. Pastor, I got all this going around. Blah, 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 blah. I'm stressed out. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, gosh, I'm with you. Okay, gosh, I love you. Can I pray with you? Hey, let me ask you a question. Have you been praying about this? No, I'm just too stressed to play. Okay, all right. Well, have you been uh, kind of worshiping at all? Kind of get some music going to settle yourself? No, no, haven't done any of that. Well, you know what? Are you looking at scripture at all? Like, are you reading your Bible because it's the living word of God and it actually comes into your soul and can transform you? Are you doing that? No. No, no, no. Well, then get the heck out of my office then. That's what I want to say. I don't say that. I don't. I really want to. I did have a little time back in Canyon City where I said, if you're having a challenge, come in and talk to us after you've read the Bible and prayed for five days. Then let's talk about it. We had a little session like that. And so what does it look like for you just to talk with God? And there's so many different tools and apps. One great app is called Lexi, Lectio, L-E-C-T-I-O, 365. It's 10 minutes of guided prayer every single day. Uh, it's just a wonderful, beautiful app. Soul formation. Serving others like you all did on Thanksgiving and others, like when you just serve others, it actually brings shalom into your life, the Bible would indicate. Worship music, putting it on, listening to it, letting it soak in. I know this is elementary, you guys. You guys are better Christians than I am. But I'm just talking to people over and over and over that aren't doing this, and they're freaking out. Eating. Can I get an amen? This is a wonderful spiritual practice. Breaking bread with people. I know it's hard right now. But being at a table together as your family. Getting ice cream. Ice cream is like heaven. What does it look like to read at least one to two scriptures a day and just say, God, what do you have for me in that? And then as best we can, stay in community. So Julie and I will be going over kind of some more detailed stuff there, but that's just a reminder to encourage you, if you're not leaning into that, then the opportunity for shalom in your life, it's there. There's opportunity. So Romans 1533. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. That's one full scripture from Paul right there, the Apostle Paul. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. So the worship team is going to come up and we're going to uh, sing a little bit before we go. Before we do, let's just, let's just have a t- Moment of shalom, moment of peace. And um, I'm going to walk you through it right now. And so if, you, if it's okay with you, if it's not too weird, just go ahead and close your eyes and take a big, deep breath, like this breath God gave you. And I just say, Holy Spirit, come. Lord, I ask that even right now you would bring to mind areas in our life that might be fragmented. And Lord, any of these fragmented parts of our life right now, we just literally ask you, would you take them? Would you put them back together? Would you heal them? Would you restore them? Right now, Lord, if, if for any of you, if it's been a while, we just want to say, Lord, we realize that your blood, your life, death, and resurrection is where we find shalom, salvation, wholeness. So this Christmas season, now is good times any, between you and God, just quietly in your mind, just say, I choose to follow you again, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. And then you just take a moment and say, you know, I thank you that I have peace with God. Jesus. Peace with the Father. Thank you, Jesus. And now, Lord, I ask 
that you would deposit through the power of the Holy Spirit peace in my life. In my mind, I'd hold all thoughts captive. In my heart, in my body. Lord, let me be in shalom and a person of shalom. Just let it come, God, right now, this moment. Let it come. I just love you, Lord. So why don't we stand, not fragmented, but together, <laughs> and allow a worship song to kind of be a way to articulate where we're at, but also receive from the Lord the real truth. So let's worship. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break at your name still. Call the sea to still, the rage in me. Jesus, 
So uh, let the Holy Spirit sink this in as a 30-second recap. This is a season of expectancy. Not expectations that we create, like it's going to happen this way or that way, and specifically at this time, but expectancy, meaning God's going to do something. I'm not sure what it is, but it's going to be good. And if it doesn't happen the way we think, we have this trust because He is a victor. All things work together for the glory of God, for those that love Jesus. So this expectancy lifestyle is a very mature way to be a Christian. And so in that season of expectancy, we put our, our, our foundational four groundings on hope. We have everlasting hope. Peace. We have received shalom and we extend shalom. Next week, joy. What does it look like to be in joy in this season? The following week, love. And then the celebration on Christmas Eve where we light the Christ candle, which uh, is just the best. It's just the best. So may you guys be encouraged. If you need prayer for anything before you go, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to see that Maybe the kingdom would come in a special way. Maybe you have a sickness and maybe tonight you'd be healed. Maybe you have a relationship thing going on and you just need the intervention of God. And I'd love to pray with you about that. You just never know when God blesses your socks off. You just never know. And also, if you're like new to Canyon View, maybe you've never been here, you have some questions about Canyon View, um, back in that room over there the door will be open and it's like we call it first Sunday but it's a way just to kind of get a quick meet and greet and answer any questions and get to know you and you can get to know us a little bit so that's available too okie dokie all right so Kathy and some others will come up to be available for prayer um so the church I grew up when I was just a snotty nosed kid always ended with this and I share that with you now. My pastor back then, his name was Oli Olschlager. Does that sound Norwegian? Yeah. And he would say what I'm saying to you now. And there was power in it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. It's from Numbers 6, 24 to 26. May the Lord bless you guys. Have a great week.